Hello, and welcome to Most Marvelous NYC, the podcast where veteran licensed New York City tour guides help you navigate the ins and outs of New York City for your very best experience. So we're your hosts. I'm Megan. I'm JT. And we're going to get into it. So today's topic, each week we choose a different topic. So today's topic is going to be It's an food. easy one. Food. Food. New York City food. And I'm super excited about this because one of my favorite things about living in New York City is that you can get any type of food that you want. You can get French food, Italian food, Burmese food, Ethiopian food. You might want everything. Probiotic, vegan, gluten-free tacos. They're here. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's so all here. Everything. But there are some New York food. Yes, I would say that we have four main food groups. Our four main food groups are bagels, hot dogs, pizza, and cheesecake. So while you're here, you need to eat all four of those food groups. And then I would Can say... Can we have like a food grouplet? A little grouplet? A I little minor? A minor? Indeed. What would you put in that grouplet? Uh, well, I, I mean, I think another one of the classic foods is like a pastrami, like a Jewish deli sandwich. I think that's one. And I then feel... I think in general, like what you were saying, there's foods from all around the world. So maybe have another little grouplet that is uh, uh, foods from around the world. Exactly. Can we talk about that too? We can definitely right. talk about that. So we're going to talk about our four main food groups, then our grouplet of pastrami sandwich, which I will say when I give tours, almost everybody asks me about where yeah. they can get a pastrami sandwich. And then the foods from around the world, because this is something that I think is so special about being in New York City, that you can get food from all over the world. And I mean, my, I, I would. I would even say like maybe like Chinese food or, or dumplings. That's almost a group unto itself. But we're going to put that in the foods from around the world. This is a very challenging category as well, because I feel that each food that we talk about, we could easily spend three hours. Three talking. hours? Like five hours. Five hours. I spent five hours talking about dumplings. There's the history of the food. We're going to give you some of our personal recommendations of where to get these foods as well. So make sure that you maybe have a, a notepad out so that you can take notes about our favorite, our favorite foods in New York City. And if you really want to deep dive into any of these foods, there's also a lot of tours that you can take. So you can take a tour with my company. You can go to mostmarveloustours.com and book. And then there's also some other companies. I'm a huge fan of Scott's Pizza Tours. Mm -hmm. it's exactly what it sounds like. They specialize in pizza and you can spend a whole day just deep diving. There are there, pizza. there's bagel tours. I mean, there's all food tours are a great thing about New York City because it's you can get a food tour that is many different kinds of foods across the day or you can get a tour where you really just focus in on one kind of food and you get to sample all the different ways that people in new york innovate in their little twists and their changes but let's get into it let's what's our first food category we're gonna start food with group a, <laughs> with a breakfast food so the breakfast food is of course bagels I eat bagels. I, I could eat bagels for every single meal. I don't know what you're talking about. This is true. It is very much a perfect food. You can have it for breakfast, lunch, dinner, a snack, midnight snack, midday snack, mid-morning snack, brunch. It's there. Bagels are there for you. That is one of the biggest challenges in my life. Only eating one bagel a day. So why don't you talk to us about bagels, New York City bagels, what makes a New York City bagel so special, so delicious, so mouth-watering that you need to eat at least one a day, if not more? So I think the first thing that we should talk about is there's a legend. Maybe it's a myth. It's a it's a kind of a, I don't know, coin of the realm. Is that, a, is that the right phrase? that two of our food groups are dependent on one of the essential elements that you find in New York and that bagels and pizza in particular, the bread products are better 
because of the water that we have. And I think there's a lot of back and forth about this. I also think that we should say that for every single one of these food topics, there are myths and counter myths and new research and new thinking every day. You talk to some people and they've, they, it, it's all over the place. The thing about the water, I mean, you've seen this, I've seen this, is people do like these scientific experiments, right? Oh, we're trying this. with New York City water is particularly good water. There's a whole thing about, is New York City water safe to drink? It's Most don't sue us. If you drink water from a puddle in Central Park, not a good idea. But if if you're drinking water in New York City, it tends to be really good. And one of the things that makes it really good is it's extremely low chlorination um, and it's mountain water. Uh, it's rainwater from the mountains upstate in the Catskills. And it is fantastic. It's got a great sort of mineral complexity. Um, and that's the profile of the water. And that does a lot to help. Um, but you can also have bad bagels in New York. One of my former favorite bagels is now on my naughty list they're using New York City water. I just don't think they make their bagels as well. But people in New York City take pizza seriously. They take bagels seriously. And that, along with the water and a lot of people who are dedicated to putting really good ingredients in, the right kind of high quality, sorry, gluten-free people, high gluten flour, especially for the bagels. Bagels need to be boiled. That's another thing. A lot of people kind of go that halfway outside of New York City. They don't quite do the whole thing. Um, and they're hand rolled. You'll see that a lot. These are boiled bagels. They're hand rolled. Um, and it's an ethnic food. This is an ethnic food that comes from the Jewish diaspora, from Eastern Europe, all, all the way back probably to the Middle East. Lots of different opinions about this. But bagels are great. They're a dense, chewy bread. They should have a little bit of a, of a crust to them hopefully there's a whole thing about whether you ever want to get a good bagel toasted or not that's a whole issue do um, you ever want to take the bread out of the middle of a bagel i'm sorry i <laughs> there bye was folks a, <laughs> i'm leaving there was what a is whole, wrong with you no, i know no, no. that's a thing there was a whole why thing would you ask me that where oh. somebody came to new york city oh. and asked for their bagel to be scooped out and, and they new were Yorkers, deported i hope I new yorkers shown the lincoln tunnel immediately they were they were Good. definitely publicly shamed don't ask for your bagel to be scooped Ch uh, in new york city <sighs> Just get a wrap. Just get a wrap. If you don't want a bread product, just get a wrap. Go someplace else. Don't go into the bagel shop. And there are bagel shops. I think that's the other thing is that when you're looking for a bagel, you really want to go to a bagel store or a bagel. I mean, there's some bagel chains or little chainlets, but you really want to go to a place that specializes in bagels. And to mention the thing about gluten-free is that there are some really interesting, I was fooled. I had a gluten-free bagel and I was like, this is pretty good. I didn't know. I didn't know that was, I was desperate for a bagel. This place was open. I was cold. I went inside and I got a bagel. And I, oh, this is interesting. It's a little different. I thought they just put a couple extra grains in, but it was totally gluten-free. Where was and, it? And it was good. This was on the Upper West Side. This was a modern, a modern bagel. I think, if, yeah, modern bagel. I've been there once. Um, I have a content creation friend named Ariel, who oh, is yeah. Urbanist mm -hmm. NYC. He is amazing. And he took me there and said it was one of his very favorite bagels in all of New York City. And I could have definitely been fooled if I didn't know that it was a gluten-free bagel. So you can get really good gluten-free food, I feel, in every category when you come to New York City. Now, I do get asked a lot in terms of traditional bagels, where are the best places to get bagels in New York City? And we have a colleague who says that the best bagel is the bagel that's the closest to you because it's going to be the freshest. Well, maybe is that someone besides me. I say yeah. that all the time. It's, it's Matt after. Oh, Matt. Well, Matt's go. So that's good because it's going to be the freshest. And that's one of the, the glories of 
being in New York is you can often, I will often, I have my favorite bagel flavors, but if I come in and I, I, I'm like, mm, what am I going to get? I will ask the guys behind the counter, what just came out of the oven? What is the freshest? And they'll, I'll just get one. Don't toast it. Nice and warm. Love it. Fantastic. But the other thing for me is that like people would ask me all the time. I mean, they still do. I've moved out of New York city, but they would say, what's your favorite bagel? And I would say, well, it's the one that's in my neighborhood because I have an alliance, an allegiance, right? Like that's my bagel place. The guys behind the counter recognize me. I recognize them. Um, they were super, I mean, the other thing too is I, I love it when you walk in and they're fast. They take your order. They move you down the counter. You pay. They hand you your bagel. It's not a production. It's nice and fast. You get your food. Um so that's La Bagel Delight. That was in Park Slope in Brooklyn. I love La Bagel Delight. Um, but like, I think that for bagel people, they have they have the one, the local neighborhood place that they like the best. You bring up a really interesting point of local favorites. And it's interesting because I find when I personally travel, like if I travel to France, I drive my best friend Kara crazy when I visit her because she lives in a lovely neighborhood that has amazing croissant. But I'm like, I must get the best croissant. And I don't care if it's on the other side of oh, Paris yeah. and it's going to take me 90 minutes to get there. I flew from New York to Paris and I want the best one. So I find that locals, and I'm recently discovering this with egg and cheese sandwiches. My co-creator fiance, David, introduced me to the glories of egg and cheese sandwiches. I now want one every single morning. Are you a vegetarian? I am not. I what What is wrong with the bacon on the bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich? What's I, going on here? I'm actually not sure. I, I I do love bacon. So I'm I may be outing myself here. Lots of oh, people no. love to say that I'm a transplant because I originally came from Florida. And I did originally come from, from Florida. So I just Folks, didn't, they don't have bacon in Florida. That's what I'm I taking just from this. didn't grow up <laughs> eating bacon, egg, and cheeses. So I've been getting these egg and cheeses and they're delicious and truly the bodega around the corner from the welcome to Times Square office where we are recording from today and the bodega around the corner from our apartment. They are my places. I'm like, these are my favorites. And I just for folks, a bodega is essentially a corner store that has a kitchen. Yeah. Right. So you're going to get your milk, your, your, your butter, your eggs, your cigarettes, your beer, and you can get a sandwich, a hot sandwich there too, that they're going to make for you. And I found myself to be very hesitant about making a video about these two bodegas for two reasons. The first one is New Yorkers get very mad at you for not gatekeeping local secrets. But the other one is, I was like, what if this isn't the best? It's my favorite. I feel very protective of this. I think it's the best egg and cheese in all of New York City. But I'm so afraid of getting the comments of people being like, oh, that's not the best. So my point, this is a very long way of asking if someone wants the best bagel in New York City, where would you recommend? They're coming from the other side of the globe. They only get a chance to eat one bagel and they're willing to travel anywhere in the five boroughs. Where do you recommend? I just don't have a favorite like that. I think there's a couple of different, eat, like, I also like Pick a Bagel. Pick a Bagel is my college favorite. It was right around the corner. I think they make an excellent bagel, top notch bagel. Um, who else is good? You know what? That I almost hesitate to say this. This is a very popular bagel nowadays, and that is Liberty Bagel. You know, Liberty Bagel, they have. This pains me to say this. They have rainbow colored bagels. They have red, white, and blue colored bagels. It's a little over the top, but their other bagels, they're pretty good. I like them. I I, I don't feel I, I took my son and my son was like, Dad, why are you taking me here? I know this place. It's just a popular place. It's not that good. And we had some bagel sandwiches, and he was like, All right, that wasn't so bad. But he was like, I want you to come down the block and do my favorite bagel place. It's right down the block. I don't know why we didn't go here in the first place. That was a day where I almost ate like five bagels in a day. Um, but Liberty is good. And that's another, you know what, to be honest, a lot of people, 
especially for bagels, there's no best. I really believe there's no best. And other people might argue there's pop-up bagels. And I, I've had those. They're, those are really, really excellent. Um, a friend of mine loves absolute bagels. Those are all the way far up, upper, upper west side. Um, but sometimes you just want to say like, I had this very good bagel and you've seen it on the internet and like Liberty bagel for my money. If you want to say like, Oh, I had this really good bagel and people are maybe if they're looking at the, the Instagram and stuff like that, they can say, Oh, is it the, the multicolored one? Don't get the multicolored one. I mean, get a get a a real bagel, a poppy seed, a sesame seed, a everything, a pumpernickel, um, a yeah, multigrain. I don't know. Those are the standards in my book: poppy seed, sesame seed, everything, or pump. Honestly, pumpernickel or everything is those are my go-to. I really don't sesame. Maybe my standard my standard order is an everything bagel with a lox cream cheese mm, that's good i will i do want to i do want to chime in real fast about pick a bagel and liberty bagel and also give some of my favorite bagel suggestions so first of all liberty bagel i agree it's amazing i discovered them because they have a birthday freebie so this is oh. very good to know so the birthday freebie on your birthday you go and you do get a rainbow bagel with like funfetti cream cheese you don't you don't get to pick your bagel it's a rainbow bagel and a Fun Fetty Cream Cheese. <laughs> but <laughs> it was really good. I mean, it, it tastes like a dessert, but it was really, really good. So I'm a big fan of that. And then we also, I also got my everything bagel with the Lox cream cheese, which was excellent. So huge fan of Liberty Bagel. Also a huge fan of Pick a Bagel. Something that I want to point out is that when we ask our tour guide colleagues what their favorite bagels are, I find that Pick a Bagel comes up the most. Mm -hmm. It seems to be this local, I want to say secret, because it doesn't typically come well, up. I've been telling people that. I think it's all my influence. Yeah. It's it's a well-known bagel shop, but I feel like when, when you see the lists of like the top 10, I don't often see pick a bagel on it but i think it should be there and then just in terms of other bagels to recommend i usually tell my guests to go to zucker's bagels mm -hmm. there's also russ and daughters i was gonna say that and Ru russ i'm gonna jump in because russ and daughters is a classic appetizing store and there's a difference between an appetizing store and a delicatessen it gets really we're not going to get deep into those weeds i'm a huge fan of russ and daughters uh they are a legacy multi-generation lower east side uh purveyor of the finest jewish foods so if you wanted to get a bagel with cream cheese and then locks on top of the cream cheese not mixed in um they're fish is fantastic they've got uh dried fruit which is actually sometimes hard to find really quality dried fruit they've got babka um and they have bagels they have the whole the whole schmear as people say i wanted to bring that up because you were talking about cream cheese on your bagels i don't often get cream cheese on my bagels because they it's it, it's expensive sometimes and that's because they give you a lot that's the thing that i think people need to understand a schmear is like a half an inch of cream cheese on the bagel you have to be prepared for that so you, you can say like can i can I have the bagel with cream cheese and i always say don't put too much on it and they always look at me like you say that every time and we ignore you every time and it's a fun game that we play um so I will usually say, could I get extra napkins and like a little plastic knife or something like that? Um, and then I scrape a lot of it off because that's just too much for me. I'm in it for the carbs, not for the dairy. So like, I'm... I thought I was the only one that did this. I always ask them to go light on the cream just a cheese. Little. And, and I always do the same thing, just a little. And they go, uh-huh. <laughs> It makes it hard to eat while you're on the go because there's cream cheese everywhere. And I'm like, ah, oh, there's cream cheese on my hand. I mean, so that's the other thing is a lot of these foods that we're talking about are foods to go. I mean, bagels and pizza are classic walking and eating foods. And I know people say all the time, like, well, walking and eating. It's the New York way. It is such a New York way. <laughs> And then I want to mention one other thing real fast on the topic of bagels. Something that I often take guests to on my tours is a store called Cossar's Bialis. Mm. 
And this is usually mind blowing for people because they come to New York City expecting bagels and then they're on a food tour and we give them Bialis. And tell us about Bialis. Uh, so I love Bialis. That's actually often when I get with cream cheese, it's usually a Bialy. Um, so Bialis are these, they're almost the size of a bagel. They're so my grandmother would say, these bagels, these bagels are not bagels. Bagels used to be small. What happened? They got so big. Uh, and so um, when you were saying traditional bagels, I'm thinking traditional bagels are a lot smaller and they're a little denser. I like the bagels today. They're chewier. They're sort of a little fluffier, but still with a chewiness to them. Um, Bialis are much, much smaller. They're almost like... Um, if I was going to say they're like a um, like a Portuguese roll, maybe, but very, very much smaller. So they're very flavorful, I think, um, roll, but they've got a little indentation in the middle that's going to have chopped onions and poppy seeds normally. And so it's a little, tiny little savory uh, uh, Jewish roll from uh, Bialystok in Poland. Um, they are very hard to find. Kosar's is probably the best in new york city um they have been making bialis consistently since they showed up on the lower east side over 100 years ago um those are really good and i'm always searching for a good one they should i think well to be honest my late uncle made them the best in california so that's the thing with the water is he was out in uh, Northern California and his came out, but Northern California has great water too from the, from out like in Yosemite from Hetch Hetchy. So like, I think it's about the quality of ingredients. It is, you want to have that good water. That's not too chlorinated. Um, but Bialis are wonderful. If you find a place that has Bialis, it's worth a try. They're a little bit of a lower calorie investment from a bagel and they're fantastic, but always savory, never sweet. And, uh, I just go for the simple. I like a little butter or a little cream cheese on them. Yay! Let's see. What, what is, is this yeah. an hour already with we bagels? Could, we could definitely talk so much more about Bialis and bagels and schmears and cream cheese, but we want to talk about more food topics. So we're going to move on to the next one, which is the hot dog. Hot dog. Hot dog. So do you have any history of the hot dog that you would like to share? Do you have a favorite hot dog? I feel that hot dogs can be quite divisive in New York City. And I've heard some people say things such as, it's a hot dog. How good can it get? So I'm curious if you have any thoughts on like, is there maximum hot dog? You know, for me, I mean, there's a couple of places that stand out in terms of like legacy. And one of the things I love about New York City is there are so many of these great legacy establishments that have been around forever. And it's almost just a pilgrimage to go to them to say it's important to have a place that has longevity and has a connection back to the old days. Um, so my two favorites really would be some of these older spots. And then the number one for me is Nathan's. And I don't think the Nathan, this is like almost sacrilege. I'm feeling a little like, I don't think the Nathan's hot dog is all that exciting, but if I'm going to be in Brooklyn and my, I mean, I lived in Brooklyn for for over two decades, the majority of my life has been in Brooklyn. All my family, my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents, you know, my kids lived in Brooklyn, five generations of us. So, like, I love Brooklyn, Coney Island, Nathan's hot dogs. It doesn't get much better than that. And the Nathan's french fries are pretty cool too. Um, but Nathan Handworker is credited with popularizing the hot dog after his boss, Charles Feltman, like, invented it. It's a sausage on a roll previously like feltman with german extraction used to serve a, a sausage and a roll on the plate together and where was charles feltman when he served this sausage and a roll on coney island and the problem was is that he would have to give you a plate with like silverware and there'd be like a potato salad and you'd wander off into like the 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 area by the beach right by and and he'd have to come pick up the plate and the silverware and it would get lost and a fork sticking out of the sand and the whole who knows 
right? And so um, he said, you know, what would be better is if you could just walk around with the sausage, I'll put it in the bun and then, ha uh -huh. And then Nathan Handworker goes off and apparently Jimmy Durante helped fund this, Nathan's. And uh, it sells everything for five cents because everything in Coney Island back then was five cents. The subway was five cents. Uh, the hot dog was five cents. Renting a bathing suit was five cents. That'll turn your stomach off of hot dogs. I know everybody. I didn't know you had to rent a bathing well, suit. Well, you could rent a bathing suit. Like if you didn't own, you could rent a wool bathing suit. And once you were done with it, they would boil it and give it to someone else. And a changing room was five cents and the rides were five cents. Everything was the nickel empire. So he sold these five cent hot dogs and became huge. It's There's the Nathan's 4th of July. Um, but the other thing that I like is a papaya dog. Um, and those kind of, I thought they they were forever, uh, but those are from the mid 20th century. But they're good. They're really good. Um, and those are the classics. And then everybody loves to do the street cart hot dog. I loved a guy. There was a guy who used to sell uh, German sausages on a, with a with a crusty roll. It was like the same thing. It was like the the Charles Feldman. You had some potatoes. You had the roll. You had the sausage. He's not around anymore. That's really that's one of the. The things that I miss in New York is Hollow Berlin. It used to be outside the University Club on Fifth Avenue. I went to Hollow Berlin. Oh, he was the best. It was really good. It's the um, same guy at the cart, German guy. It was a line around the block. The University Club hated it because the University Club is unbelievably fancy. It is beautiful in there. Very sophisticated people. And he was out there. He just had a very funny relationship with them, I think. No, I miss them. But there's, I mean, there's other street food. I think we're going to talk about some of the other street food that's really worth checking out in our foods from around the world section. I do want to mention um, two other hot dogs. So there's a place called Criff's Dog. Yeah, I would. Yeah, um, it's much famously, more, much more recent. It's much yeah, more dogs, recent. Yeah. This is not, you know, a long legacy of New York City hot dogs. And I believe it's sort of like at a storefront of a speakeasy as well. But this hot dog place, Criff Dog, they have all kinds of crazy hot dog concoction. So you go there and they throw like avocado and sauerkraut and beans and I don't know, all sorts of crazy things. So if you want a really maximalist, is that a word? Yeah, Maximalist totally. hot that dog. That is a great description criff dogs is where you want to go is that like and east village is that where that is yeah i've never had those and it's always been on my list and i've never gotten around to it they're good they're fun they're quirky they're a little bit different and when we're talking about like how good can a hot dog be sometimes it depends on like what you put on top of it mm -hmm. so you can get quite creative and you can make your own hot dog they have concoctions that they have come up with or else you can create one of your own and then i do have a favorite hot dog in new mm. york city i have a strong opinion about it um i do like i love nathan's there's a nathan's cart so there's the original nathan's out on coney island right. and you can go there and it's very historic it's been on the same spot for like a hundred years but they have carts all over the city and often if i'm doing a statue of liberty tour right where the boats dock there's a bunch of nathan's the one that's the closest to where the boats let off i just grab myself a hot dog shove it in my face as i run onto the subway but if i really want to treat myself and david we actually go to McSorley's. Oh. And they serve Feltman's hot dogs. I've never done. I've been to McSorley's and had a burger, but not their a hot, dog. hot dogs are so good. And whenever David and I are in the neighborhood, we're like, should we get hot dogs from McSorley's? Because, and I don't know if it's the Feltman's hot dog or the way that McSorley's prepares them or a combination of both, or if it's the, the ales that they're serving and how they pair with the hot dogs. But I am, if I am looking for the best New York City hot dog for me, it's going to McSorley's pub and getting a Feltman's hot dog. Do you get the light so ale or the dark ale? I usually get one of both. Oh. So the, uh, this is the other thing to know about McSorley's is that all the ale, oh, they only have ales, and all the ales come in 
two glasses. And they're half pints. They're half pints. And you basically... Do you mix it? Do you say a half of light and a half of dark? I say one of each. One of each. Oh. Yeah. So they come out and wow. they... Wow. I mean, it's it's arguably the oldest continually operating yeah. pub in New York City. There are... One of the things about all of these food establishments is... I feel that as historians, there's always new research that comes out yes. and someone will find, you know, an article from 75 years ago. And in that article, it proves that this other bar was open slightly longer or a day longer. And there's legends. People don't like giving up legends or familiar stories that I are perhaps legendary and maybe just fake. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. But either way, McSorley's is very historic. It's a very cool place. It's maybe not the place you want to go if you are traveling with kids, but if you are no, traveling... No, they will not let the kids in. They if didn't you, let women in. They did not let women in until, about until 40, 50 years very ago. Very recently. Um, they didn't even have a women's bathroom until even more recently after that. Th their bathrooms are what you would expect from a pub. Don't go there for the bathrooms. I mean, it, it is, they've the been around since, uh, I mean, since how, how far back? They, at least the farthest back I can think where I know they were in around in the 1860s. Yeah, let's see. I know that we have my co-creator David over at the computer, so maybe he can get us an exact date and let us know. But I believe I mean, definitely that's the over 1860s. 150 years old. I mean, it's really unbelievable. Yeah, they have a um, thing that Houdini put his handcuff on the bar. Yeah, if you go, there's there's all of these traditions with McSorley's where, uh, as David just mentioned, you can find handcuffs that belong to Harry Houdini. You can find uh, wishbones from 1854. Oh. Yeah. 1854. Yeah. That's. Do they grill the hot dogs? Is that what know. it is? Maybe. Cause a lot of hot dogs, people call them dirty water dogs because they boil them. They have them in the water that keeps them warm and there's nothing. I mean, everybody, ew, oh, street cart, ew. It's people think it's like a, a challenge. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I also want to just mention, but that's how most of them are. They're, they're boiled rather than grilled. I also just want to mention in terms of eating at food carts, these food carts are actually inspected more frequently than restaurants, and they get fined very, very heavily for every part of an ins inspection that they do not pass. So there's a lot of incentive for them to keep it really, really clean. And I once gave a food tour to a very high ranking health and hygiene official at a very well known food brand. And they were freaking out because we were going to these food carts and they insisted on inspecting every single one themselves before eating. Anything. Oh, that must have been charming. And they could not I'm find sure the food cart guys were just, oh, sure. Come on back. We've got room for one and a half of us. Go ahead. Come on in. I won't cook. You can inspect. But the important thing is that he couldn't find a single thing wrong with any of the food carts that we visited. So in terms of eating from any of these food carts, eating the street food, I am going to say, again, don't sue us if you happen to get like the one hot dog that isn't perfect. But I mean, I've gotten food poisoning from like fancy restaurants. And maybe from food carts too. Yeah, like there's no. It happens, but it's, it 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 occasionally happens, but it happens with no more regularity for a food cart for me at least. Maybe I'm sensitive uh, than it does for a nice restaurant. So like, go do it. It's uh, they're hardworking folks, and uh, they generally keep their uh, place clean. It's the New York way. Yeah. All right. I think it's time to move on to our next food group, which is uh, this one. We're going to have to really work hard to stay on time. Oh, no. I know which we one this is. We are going to pizza. I mean, there's even controversy about like how to eat a pizza. First of all, like cutting a slice of pizza, like it would not like. Don't use a fork. That's before, what we're trying to say. Before, That's going to get you in a lot of trouble. Before we get into how to eat our pizza, let's talk about what pizza to eat. And again, I'm going to go back to this. Do we, like, we don't need to define pizza, do we? No. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to preface this by saying 
if you really want to do the deep dive into pizza, you really want to take Scott Wiener's pizza tours. And he has one. It's like a pizza bus tour where uh -huh. you will yeah. literally spend the whole day learning about pizza and you still won't know everything. There's still going to be more to know. So this is very much a overview of pizza, the very reduced version of pizza. And what I'm going to say is what I often just say really quickly if I'm giving a bus tour, a highlights bus tour. So New York City pizza, you can get every type of pizza that you want, thin crust, thick crust, meat lovers, vegan, gluten free. We have dessert pizza, pizza that has a sugar cookie crust with a Nutella sauce and marshmallow toppings. So if you're looking for New York pizza, what are you looking for? And you are looking for pizza made in a coal burning oven. The original pizzas in Italy were made in wood burning ovens. The immigrants who came to New York City looked around. They didn't see much wood, but we did have Not a lot so many of trees. coal. <laughs> so they used coal to heat their ovens. So what I usually say is that coal burning oven is the traditional New York City style pizza. But then there's another pizza that people really associate with New York City. And that is the greasy dollar slice that a lot of people fold in half and shove in their face as they're running to the subway. So just for the ease of talking about it in a somewhat condensed time frame. Let's talk primarily about those two. And you also had a beautiful way of dividing it between like traditional pies and slices and the newer pizzerias. Yeah. So, I mean, in my, oh God, I don't know how we're going to do this in, in this amount of time. Um, so there is a legend, and I thought this was a legend for the longest time, and then I found someone who found some paperwork and they put it online uh, about um, the cheese that you used. So apparently in the in the like the 1930s or some sometime back then, uh, Al Capone shook down the pizzerias and said, "You're gonna use my cheese." But he kind of granted a waiver to a couple of guys. And the legend that I've heard, and there's a lot of back and forth about this, is that it was like the guys who learned from Gennaro Lombardi or, or some version of that. And Lombardi's is often considered to be the oldest or the first pizzeria. Um, but some places like Grimaldi's and Totono's and John's and Lombardi's and Patsy's. And these are sort of the old school classic style and they use fresh mozzarella they um are in and out of the oven really fast they're very high heat typically coal burning now you sometimes find with some of the new classics they're wood burning um and that's really just a resource thing but the ones that you're talking about are the gas oven um and they're not bad they're not bad i mean there are some legitimately good i'm thinking um i took some guests from Australia out to Crispy out in um, um, all the way south. Was, this was, we were going out for a Diker Lights Christmas lights tour and went to Crispy. And um, they said it was the best pizza in the world that they had ever had. And that's gas oven, but they take a lot of care in making that pizza. Um, but those are the classics. So it's a thin crust. It's all, sometimes there's a little bit of a char on the bottom of it. Um, and that's almost like how, you know, there's the little char you, you often see the, the pizza makers going and there's one other guy who is a classic and, and he's passed away. Um, Dom DeMarco who made pizza out at Defaro's on Avenue J. And that was my favorite pizza. I would say that for years and years. And now that Dom has passed, it's not up on the top of my list, but those are the classics, the fresh mozzarella, the char on the bottom. And Juliana's has kind of come in as a classic. They have a family legacy as well. Now, for these classics, can I go in and get a slice if I just want to taste it? It's like John's of Bleecker Street says, I think they say this in the window still, no slices. So a lot of these places are no slice places. Like Tafara's was a slice place. It's still a slice place. They're still pretty good, all things considered. But a lot of these places, you're going to go in, you're going to sit down, you're going to eat the whole pie. Is what they, I don't know, people well, call that. It's a weird thing to call the, it. One of it's the a pizza pies is I find that people feel intimidated because these pies are huge. Yeah, they they can are be. giant. 
And maybe I just have a crazy stomach. Sometimes my dad says my stomach is the TARDIS, bigger on the inside mm -hmm. than it is on the outside. But I can easily eat at least half of that pizza oh. alone. I have definitely eaten a whole pizza by myself before. So I think because the crust is so thin that it's not as much food as you necessarily think. So don't be intimidated. Don't not go to a place because you have to order a whole pie. Yeah. And they're, that I think, reasonably priced as well for a whole pie. It costs about the same as you would pay if you were going to a restaurant i grew up and uh, my mom always said that pizza is not like a meal we said let's go we had a favorite pizza place and um we'd say let's go to kinchley's and she said pizza is not a whole meal and i was like mom what are you talking about and i still feel the same way pizza is a, a meal unto itself and, and you you look at that big pie and it is it's very it again it's should be very thin if we're talking about classic New York City pizza. Now, there is, I think, kind of a classic style of pizza that is coming into fashion now. And normally we talk about the round pie. But there are these square pies that follow along in the thin crust and they're grandma slices or grandpa slices. And they've got a little bit of onion mixed into the sauce. They have a little bit less of the cheese. Um, sometimes they're upside down. So the cheese is on the bottom. That's slightly like a Detroit style. I like those, and I normally don't say get the thick, what is it, Sicilian style, but if you get this, and those are the square slices, and if you go to a place like Ellen B. Spumoni, that's kind of their classic slice, um, but the grandma slices or the grandpa slices, those are worth a try. They're, they, they've been around forever, but they're gaining in popularity, so a corner pizzeria is maybe going to have them nowadays. So I'm just going to give you a couple of rapid fire questions because I know that we could talk about this for forever, but what makes a New York City slice if I only want one slice? Oh, like where should you go for that? Um, what What is it? Oh, what is the slice? I mean, the slice is just, it's the... Is it, does it, what's the crust It's like? a wedge of the pie. So the crust, what I'm trying to ask yeah. the leading question is. I, I can tell um, there's a leading question If you here. are looking for a New York City I'm slice. I'm not your leading man. <laughs> you are. <laughs> not for this. What are we talking about? <laughs> if you're looking for a New York City slice, typically the crust is a little bit thicker than if you're going to like the wood burning or the coal oh. burning pizza. And that gives Oh, it... like if you're like a regular, just a regular run of the mill slice. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a little thicker because like theoretically you're going to walk around with it. Right. So the very, like the, the yeah, coal burning pizza, saying. the wood burning pizza, it tends to have a very thin much, much crust. Thinner. It's very hard to pick up because the crust is so thin. The, what we would call the dollar slice, although it doesn't tend to cost a dollar anymore, has a thicker crust to it. In terms of pricing your dollar slice, what do you think? It's funny because I'm calling it a dollar slice, but it doesn't always cost a dollar. What do you think an appropriate price would be to pay for a plain slice of cheese pizza? So there's uh, there's the whole thing about the dollar slice, and the dollar slice is very inexpensive pizza. I think that dollar slices are great at 2 o'clock in the morning. If you've been out all night. Who would do that? I think that's what a dollar slice is really good for. But there's a whole legend about the way that the price of pizza tracks the price of a subway ride. Um, and so that's a kind of interesting way of looking at it, that that's kind of what you should be thinking in terms of as a as a reasonable price. But I'll, I mean, I'll go $350 for a plain slice. That's not so bad. I mean, I have a favorite slice to go which is made in new york pizza and they i thought they made to go new york city i used to work up on the upper west side a lot and i would say oh, you know i'm feeling a little hungry i didn't bring lunch today and i would walk down to the one made in new york pizza place that i knew it was right by the 72nd street subway on broadway and they just have a bunch of great slice flavors they have good cheese they have good sauce they have a good crust they're fast um, and I like that. And I could fold it in half, walk to the subway. If I wasn't really hungry, I could wait in the park for an extra minute. But that's my favorite. And now it turns out I see them all over the place. 
they've got a bunch of different locations and that's my, that would be my pick i think they're really solid for like a three dollar 350 slice for my slice my greasy slice i'm a huge fan of joe's joe's, oh, joe's is a great yeah i feel like it's always up there on new york city's lists um it's also featured in the marvel movies so if you are a huge mcu fan like me you are also getting a little bit of movie history in there as well this is probably and the very... joe's with the long the oldest joe's is also down in greenwich village yes. it's right on father demo square but there's a bunch of joe's there's a joe's right around the corner from us here in the welcome no Times square studio exactly right around the and that has a longer line typically just as a heads up to people um, if you go down to Greenwich Village, that place, I don't know if it moves faster or just fewer people. It's, I mean, slightly out of the way in Greenwich Village. But I like that because you can go and sit in Father Demo Square actually has a fountain. It's the fountain that a lot of people think is the Friends Fountain. But there's a lot of benches there. So it's a great place to go and sit and people watch and eat a good classic New York City slice, which is going to be like on a white paper plate. <laughs> I mean that if I don't get a slice on a white paper plate, I feel like something's wrong with the world. So just saying. I I 100 percent agree. And I feel like there's a lot of places down in the village to get slices. There's Percy's pizza mm -hmm. that you can get. Um, I'm also a big fan of two bros pizza. I know that some people kind of laugh at me for that, but if you just want to spend like a dollar twenty-five cents and get a piece of pizza that's gonna fill you up, that's great. And they that's like my 2 a.m. pizza. They just opened up fairly recently a pizzeria called Upside Pizza where it's two bros, but they tried to elevate that and they have more of a sourdough crust, which I think is really good. I like upside too. I mean, there's some, I'm, it's hard to go wrong. And it's then, hard to go wrong. And then we have more modern pizzerias that are very trendy now. One of the ones that's coming to mind is Roberta's Pizza. Yeah. Roberta's Pizza is out in Bushwick. They're opening one over by Penn Station. Oh. Coming in a couple months. Now. Oh, I think I've seen. Yeah, that. later in 2024, they're announcing that Roberta's is opening at Penn Station. I think that they use a wood burning oven. I could be wrong about that, but I think have, that's right. It's like a modern twist on a traditional pie. So I'm a huge fan of Roberta's. If you make it out to Bushwick and go to their original location, I think that that is definitely worth it. And then another modern take. This is one that's very near and dear to my heart. So as I mentioned, we are coming to you from the Welcome to Times Square studios. They are sponsoring this podcast. They are a billboard in the heart of Times Square where you can put your photo, your business's photo, a loved one's photo on this billboard for as low as $150 and that photo will show 24 times in a 24 hour period. And it starts at 15 seconds every showing and that adds up. So it's something like $6.50 per appearance. It's so much fun. If you want to book, visit timesquarebillboard.com and you can use the code Megan10 for 10% off. They partner with a pizzeria called unregular pizza and unregular pizza i think that their story is so cool because they started during the pandemic so these are two it's like a crazy time to start uh, it blows my mind restaurants were closing left, left and, and right, right and yet this pizzeria was born so we have these immigrants from italy who came to new york city it's the pandemic they're trying to lift people's spirits so they're cooking this traditional roman style pizza and they know that people don't have money and can't afford it so they do a barter system where they it's say if you bring in so like cool. a bottle of wine or if you sing us a song or write us a poem or if you baked some muffins and you have some extra muffins, we'll give you a pizza. And people loved this pizza so much that they created such a demand that they opened up a brick and mortar store. And that became so popular that they now have three brick and mortar stores in Manhattan. That is very cool. And a bakery. And they create all of these different events. They've represented New York City in pizza competitions and they're really famous for putting a whole burrata 
on top of their pizza. It's oh so goodness. decadent. Oh so my gosh. I just wanted to shout out on regular pizza as well before we move on to our next topic, which is cheesecake. Well, do you have a favorite topping? Can we just do that? Before oh, of we... pizza? Yeah. I like pepperoni and Your sausage. Pepperoni. You like the two together? No, I choose one. Oh. I'm I... also I'm also a white pizza girl. Yeah. I also like I like like artichoke sauce. Oh, so the artichoke pizza, artichoke basile. I mean, there's so many great pizza places in New York. You this is a very difficult topic. I think that we could just do an entire show and just talk about all the different great pizzas. And maybe. Maybe we will. Maybe we will. We should do one where we actually eat the pizza. We should eat the pizzas. Mm, I'm for that. I think it's also lunch. Maybe that's, Take <laughs> that's where I'm getting this idea from. NYC on the road. All right. So we need to move on to our next topic, which cheesecake. is cheesecake. So what do you have to say about cheesecake? You know, I think cheesecake is interesting. I was trying to figure out more about cheesecake. One of the things that's, I think, always funny is that everybody thinks of Philadelphia cream cheese and they think it's from Philadelphia and that, like, really cheesecake is a Philadelphia thing. But Philadelphia cheese, uh, cream cheese comes from upstate New York. So go Who figure. Knew? Go figure. I think the cheesecake that we're thinking of is big on the cream cheese, uh, graham cracker crust, essentially pretty thick. Um, and there's a classic cheesecake place in New York. There's one, um, probably the most famous cheesecake in New York has two branches on either side of Times Square. It's Junior's. I'm preferential to the one on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn, which is the original Brooklyn again. I do want to mention something about juniors. I think that almost every New Yorker will tell you that they currently make the best cheesecake in New York City. That being said, you are going to walk into juniors and you're going to say, why did these tour guides tell me to go to the most touristy place in all of New York City? Because it looks like a tourist trap, but the food is really good and their cheesecake is most marvelous. It's amazing. It's so good stuff. You can sit down and eat it. You can get the cheesecake to go and eat it in your hotel. You can bring it back with you on the airplane. Oh, the thing want. I like the most is that the one over it, it, in Southern Times Square right on Schubert Alley. If you go around the corner, there's just slices to go. Yeah. There's a separate entrance for like your to-go slice. And the the it's interesting. I was looking into the whole history of cheesecake and there's like these differentiations and like New York cheesecake is not supposed to have cherries on top or what a fruit or whatever. I, I don't think anybody pays that much attention to it now. I think in a lot of ways, a lot of those regional differences are kind of erased. Maybe we're wrong about that. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But that classic juniors is classic, but there's other options too. Do you have other? Yeah, my favorite other option to juniors for these traditional cheesecakes is Eileen's cheesecake. Eileen's cheesecake, they they typically come in these very small circular personal cheesecakes. And they come in a bunch Hard of to beat flavors. A personal cheesecake. They come in a bunch of flavors. And what I recommend is that you go with friends and you order a bunch of different flavors. Oh, that's a good idea. And you sample them all. They are all delicious. What's I am, your favorite? I don't think I've ever had an... It's been a long time since I've had an Eileen's. What's your favorite flavor? So this really surprised me because I am a chocoholic. I love chocolate. Like I would just inject chocolate into my veins if I can. So you I got the do a chocolate. chocolate show. Oh, I should. I got the chocolate. The chocolate was great, but it was the mango that was my Ooh. favorite. And I never would have guessed this if I wasn't trying a bunch of different flavors. And I was trying a bunch of different flavors. And I was like, what is up with this mango? That it sounds amazing. So good. But I also want to put out another cheesecake option to you. So a lot of people, again, they're thinking of these slices, these cream cheese based cheesecakes. Mm -hmm. But I, think I know where you're going here. I'm going to encourage you to go to Chinatown and try. I don't Whoa. know if it's the official Whoa. name, but there's something known as a 
bouncy cheesecake. I do not. <laughs> I do not know what wizardry goes into this cheesecake, but it is really bouncy. It's really light. It's really fluffy. I would recommend that you go to a place called Keki's Modern Cakes. I believe it's on Mott Street. If it's not on Mott Street, it's on Mulberry Street, and you can come and yell at me. But Keki's Famous Cakes, they make this bouncy cheesecake. They give you a a personal is it cheesecake. round? It is you make round. it sound like it's round. It's round. It's round. It's like a ball. You buy a whole cheesecake and you're like, I just wanted a slice. And then you taste it and you're like, no, I wanted the whole cheesecake. Oh, it's so light cheesecake. and delicious. <laughs> and I have, on every occasion, I can't even share it with David. It all goes in my, my belly because it is so delicious. And it's just a nice, interesting, different twist on a cheesecake. So you can try the traditional juniors and then go try Keki's Modern Cakes and get their bouncy cheesecake and have your mind blown. You know, I thought you were going to go someplace a little different. And that was, I thought you were going to say like a very tradition Italian, like ricotta cheesecake that you might get at like Vinieros down in the East Village or something like that. But I actually have an alternative to juniors as well. And they're fairly traditional, but it's a place that's famous in New York City for something else, which is cupcakes. Um, but I like the little Magnolia cheesecakes. Um, I think those are actually really good. And again, a lot of it is just about like the high quality ingredients. And for me, it's how easy is it to get and walk with. And they have little personal cheesecakes. And there's one in Penn Station. There's one at Rockefeller Center. The original Magnolia is down in the West Village. Um, but they're a local place. And I like I just kind of like them. My uh, my cousin works there. So, you know, it's so we got some cheesecake options, and we're now going to move on to our little grouplets and the first one of those is pastrami and i find pastrami to be very interesting because i actually do not like pastrami i think probably because i grew up with like the lunchable equivalent of pastrami oh, and i thought that it was regrettable it was very regrettable it was very yeah. <laughs> very not not most marvelous and i came to new york and I started giving food tours and there were pastrami stops. And, and you're like, oh no. I was like, I don't even know what to do because I can't <laughs> eat this. However, there are places in New York City that make a pastrami disbeliever like myself. <laughs> like, I actually crave the pastrami from these places. And I just want to list them off real fast. Yeah, and I'll go. let you talk a little bit about pastrami. So of course, I'm going to say Katz's. Katz's is worth the hype. It's worth the line. Everything you hear about it is true. Yes, it's touristy. Tourists go there because it's awesome. And locals go there. I mean, that's the other thing, too, is there are a lot of locals who complain about the tourists because they've been going forever. Um, the one thing about Katz's is don't lose your ticket. You'll yes. understand when you get in. They're going to hand you a ticket. Don't lose your ticket. It's true. And then just around the corner from the Welcome to Times Square studio on 43rd Street, there is the Brooklyn Deli. It sounds like it, it should be in Brooklyn, but it's on 43rd Street um, and like Broadway. It's really, really close to Times Square and their pastrami is out of this world. I tried it for like a marketing event and I didn't expect anything. I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I have to eat this pastrami <laughs> and make it look good. And I have been back to eat those pastrami sandwiches several times because they are so good. And then there is the Carnegie Diner, which is not the not Carnegie, the Carnegie Deli, Deli. That R.I.P. That closed. But the Carnegie Diner in the theater district makes really good pastrami. I liked it as a pastrami disbeliever. And when I went originally, I was with some like bro dudes and they were like, this is the best pastrami. This is better than Katz's. So there's three pastrami options from someone who doesn't even like pastrami typically. I like pastrami pretty well. I like brisket. So you'll often find the brisket sandwiches and the pastrami sandwiches kind of in the same places. 
I think the other thing too is that you definitely want mustard on your whether it's pastrami or brisket, and you want it on rye bread. And those are the tips. Sometimes people will ask when you're at the table, do you want mustard? Do you want it on what kind of bread do you want it on? And the answer is mustard, yes. And rye bread, yes. Or like a marble rye. That would be the pumpernickel and the rye. Anyway, um, I think that you can get a decent pastrami or a decent brisket at Junior's, right? So you can go and two birds with one stone. Yeah, not together. You want the cheesecake on the side. But the pastrami's great on a burger. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, so there's all sorts of stuff. You can get a burger with the pastrami ground into it also. So there's all sorts of different stuff. Um, I like a place out in Brooklyn called David's Brisket House. And what's really interesting is that David's Brisket House has been around for a long time. It was founded by a Jewish family. Uh, and now it's owned by a Yemeni Muslim family uh, in a predominantly black neighborhood in Brooklyn, Bed-Stuy. And it's just kind of this fascinating mix of all these different cultures. And the food is fantastic. It's kind of off the beaten path, but a lot of people recognize it as uh, a great alternative to some of the big names that you were talking about, like Katz's and, and like that. Um these are ethnic foods. I mean, that's the interesting thing about David's is that you think like, well, this is like a Jewish food. It's an Eastern European Jewish food. And, and there's this sort of cross-cultural love that comes into it. And a lot of it is the quality of the ingredients, how much people care that the food is going to be good. Um, it's the love that goes into it, as we often say. Um, you know, there's one other place that I was thinking of that I wanted to mention, and this is a little funny because a lot of times we say, oh, this place is gone. So Ben's Deli, which is um, down in the 30s, Ben's Deli was around forever. They closed, but to rebrand and reopen. And I don't think I've seen that they've reopened yet, but keep your eyes open for that. Um, and that is a traditional kosher deli. So that is uh, a, a for observant Jews who are following the ritual protocols for food. And it's the same thing is that the, in, at David's, there's very similar rules about food for Muslims. It's called halal food. Um, and that is halal. Uh, I believe it's halal certified uh, brisket and pastrami at David's, which pretty much means it's, it's, it's a little complicated, but it's, it's, pretty much close to kosher too. Well, this actually brings us really nicely into our last little grouplet, which is foods from around the world. And this should probably be an entire episode in and of itself. It will be. We I'm will, predicting it will be. We, so we're going to give you like the super fast rundown of this. But one of the things that I started doing, one of the very first things I did when I started my social media channels was I bought a big scratch off map. Oh, I love your map. And my goal is to scratch off every country in the world by eating food. I'm well, here's an interesting thing. I'm not incredibly close. Part of that is I made things a little bit difficult. Like I didn't want to just go to an Italian restaurant and cross off all of Italy. I wanted to cross off the different regions oh my of Italy. So yeah, that's taking forever. But one of the really interesting things is that Russia is most of the map. So literally I need to go to one Russian <laughs> restaurant and like the whole map. It's like a quarter of the land. I don't know yeah. exactly how much, but Russia's huge. It's a lot. Um, and we just ate at an amazing Brazilian restaurant called Barambao. Mm. I can't pronounce anything that we ate there because my Portuguese is terrible. But it was my first introduction to Brazilian food. We had a picanha steak, which blew mm. my mind. I'm going to panho del queijo. I know it's like this Brazilian cheese bread mm. that I think is gluten free. It was out of this world because <laughs> it's mostly cheese <laughs> uh, but the thing is that you can truly get we went to a burmese restaurant yeah. together that was great um and i love i did not grow up in a place where you had access to all mm -hmm. of these different ethnic foods from all over the world so the fact that you can come to new york city and eat i think from 
almost any country that exists in the world, you will be able to find a food. And there's here. ways. I mean, it's really interesting because there are there's this sort of this legend and it's kind of true is that if you take the seven train out of Manhattan, you get on a Grand Central Terminal and like the next stop, you're going to be in Queens and a couple stops in, you start getting off the train. Once it goes elevated, you get off the train and it's a different part of the world that you can be eating the cuisine and you get back on the train, you go another stop and now you're, uh, you know, it's like it's Punjabi food and then it's Tibetan food and then it's Ecuadorian food and very authentic, right? Not geared towards, uh, you know, the palates of people who are like, I don't want anything too adventurous. It's all the stuff from back home, um, all along the number seven line, all the way out to Flushing, Queens, which brings us to Chinese food, which is one of those food groups, which I feel like has maybe fallen off. And I don't think that people come to New York looking for Chinese food. But when I grew up, I grew up, I was born here lived here for a number of years, but then was rudely, against my wishes, removed from the city, and we went to New Jersey. But my father worked in Lower Manhattan, and the big treat about getting to see him at his office was that it was right around the corner from Chinatown. And that having Chinese food as part of the rotation of foods, my favorite are dumplings, and I love the dumplings in Chinatown, you can get five, six dumplings for a dollar, a dollar fifty. They are delicious. Um, there's a couple of hole in the wall places over by Columbus Park that I absolutely love. I've been there with my kids. They are obsessed with it. Um, we go, we went into Columbus Park and ate the dumplings there. So I love that. I love the Chinese bakeries in Chinatown. I love a roast pork bun. Have you had those? Yes, it's so the the food in Chinatown for me is when I leave New York City, especially if I go home to visit my family in Florida, and I have the best family in the world, not to brag. But the thing that I miss is the food in Chinatown, yeah. like the chili oil that you get. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. It's and because I didn't grow up with access to this authentic Asian food food dim sum the dumplings oh my goodness the rice rolls i find it hilarious that almost all my favorite places start with joe's like joe's shanghai <laughs> or, or joe's shanghai. ginger or <laughs> joe's steamed rice roll or joe's like, pizza i don't know who this joe guy is but he makes really good food jo joe's in charge of all the good food in new york <laughs> um yeah the the food in chinatown is out of this world. And this is really something that I do recommend a tour for because it can get overwhelming. Oh, yes. You yes. go and you're just like, I don't know what, because everything at least appears to be a hole in the wall. Almost everything does. And you don't know which one to go into. And the, the truth is they're probably all going to be amazing. But some of them, um, on New Year's Day, David and I went to, I think it was called the Golden Unicorn. Oh, yeah, the Golden Unicorn. But you have to like go to the for side sum? of this building. For dim sum? Yeah. yeah. Go to the mm -hmm. side of a building, mm -hmm. take an elevator up. Like you would never find it if you're just walking around. And this dim sum is out of this world, I took my one of my best friends and her husband when they came to visit. We went and you know, they don't speak a lot of English at the Golden Unicorn, but we found ways of communicating. And well, wow. a lot of that for dim sum, it's great. You just point out that yeah. <laughs> we want that. Well, that and, looks good. But even then, like was they had these little buns that had a piggy face on it. I think it was a piggy face. And I was like, it must be a pork a bun. Pork bun. <laughs> and I bit into it and it was like a custard bun. What? I wasn't expecting that. But I mean, it was so good. And this is why, in my opinion... You really want to take a tour of Chinatown. You really want to take a food tour of the Lower East Side, mm, Lower mm -hmm. East Side, Chinatown, Little Italy, because the guide, they will have, I mean, it, it will have been horrible for them to do all this research, eating at these amazing restaurants to help you find the best one. But that's going to be how you as a visitor are going to find, in my opinion, the best places in Chinatown, Little Italy, Lower East Side. Spicy Village is another one that I just want to shout out. I oh, get... You know who I like is Xi'an? 
Oh, they're so good. Yeah. You want to get their cumin lamb. Spicy mm -hmm. cumin lamb is what you want to get. Cumin at lamb Sean. burger. Or their pulled noodles. They're famous for the pulled, the hand pulled noodles. And for the longest time, they refused to deliver because they said, these noodles, you have to eat them fresh. You have to eat them right away. They're going to hand pull them, throw them into, you know, your, your spicy, your drunken. I forget what the, the best one there is. Um, and it's they, the spicy cumin lamb. That's the one that they say that they do the best. They do. Like, and they do they, the most business on. I think they were on Anthony Bourdain uh -huh. and that was what they showcased. Yeah. Well, so I like the spicy lamb burgers. They actually put it on like a little bun. It's real. They're great. I really like them. That's a local, a local place too that yeah. I really like. I'll have to try that because at Spicy Village, I always get the pancake with beef, which is close, to, which oh, I imagine is the mm -hmm. same thing. But whenever I give food tours of Chinatown, Little Italy, Lower East Side, I always ask, what's your favorite thing? And every time it has been the Spicy Village pancake with beef. It is out of this world. So if you would like to book a tour with one of my guides, you can visit mostmarvelousTours.com. But again, there's tons of tour companies that can give you a tour that matches your time frame, your budget. And your that. specialization. Exactly. Huge fan, again, of Scott's Pizza Tours. I wish I got a commission because I'd be a millionaire for yeah, and every then time. Ben's Bagel Tours. There's, I mean, there's so much good stuff. There's Bob's Pizza Tours as well. Chelsea Market offers a food tour of There should Chelsea be a Joe's. Market. <gasps> we should put that together. It should together. be Joe's Cheesecake. <laughs> I'm going to be a Joe and make a cheesecake now. <laughs> yeah, so much good food and again we could do a whole episode like five episodes on foods from around the world we could just do a like through chinatown episode oh my goodness through and little italy episode the thing is that we only talked about manhattan's chinatown there are chinatowns all throughout the five boroughs oh, yeah. of new york flushing City. chinatown queens Flushing's Chinatown. Sunset Park and oh. Bensonhurst in Brooklyn. Okay. Actually, I am getting hungry now. So maybe I, I know, need I to think go. We need get, to wrap this up and get some food. To go get some dumplings. Um, so I hope that everybody enjoyed this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure that you click subscribe. Like and subscribe. It helps us bring you more episodes like this. Also, feel free to share it with a friend if you know someone coming to yes, New York please. City or who you think that this might help. So you can find me at The Megan Daily. You can find JT. I'm at Know It All New Yorker on a bunch of the social medias. And also, if you want your face on a giant Times Square billboard, visit timesquarebillboard.com. Thank you so much, and we hope you have a most marvelous trip to New York City. See you soon.